Welcome to the reading on Alternative Investments Portfolio Management. On uh, the, this chart, we see a number of different types of alternative investments. And uh, they are introduced here with their abbreviations, and we are uh, using those abbreviations also further down the road. So it's worthwhile to uh, just uh, notice them here. Real estate um, is part of the game, private equity, commodities, hedge funds, managed futures, and uh, distressed securities. So these are the alternative investments we are looking into. Uh, there are a number of common features of an alternative investments. And here we go, that's important to remember as well. So there is a degree of, they show a degree of illiquidity. And because of that, uh, investors want to get a compensation for this one, and that translates into a return premium. Then alternative investments tend to be diversifying relative to a portfolio which would only have stocks and bonds in them, and that's due to the correlation which tends to be much lower than one with those both types of assets. Uh, many of these alternative investments come with uh, high due diligence costs for portfolio managers because they have to do all sorts of research to understand uh, those uh, alternative investments in detail. Uh, when we work with uh, fund managers, with hedge fund managers and so on, performance appraisal is rather difficult because it's very difficult to create valid benchmarks for those alternative investments. Uh, and uh, the final point is actually a very good, so to say, very good news. The area here is informationally less efficient. It's also less researched. Maybe it's also because it's a bit complicated. Therefore, it offers opportunities, for instance, for generating some alpha. Then in terms of alternative investments, they can be classified into different groups. So one group is that we have uh, investments which provide us with an exposure to particular risk factors that are not easily available through stocks and bonds. So risk factors that are different from what we get when we invest in stocks and bonds. Um, and uh, examples for this are real estate or long positions in uh, commodities. Uh, then another group here, the second group, um, provides us with exposure um, to specialized investment strategies and to specialized skills of investment managers. And you would find that, for instance, in hedge funds, because hedge funds apply particular uh, um, hedge fund strategies or also managed futures. And then the third group would be a combination uh, where both risk factors, significant particular risk factors play a role, which are different from those you get in stocks and bonds, and equally where strategies and skills are essential to be successful, and that might be the case difference with private equity and distressed securities. When we as a portfolio manager want to invest in uh, alternative investments, we might have to work with hedge fund managers, we might have to work with other fund managers, we might want to select uh, managers, and we have to undertake due diligence. And here we go, this is uh, eight points, uh, eight points which should be part of uh, due diligence when we do active manager selection. The first point is we would uh, go to the manager and interview them and see what is actually the market opportunity, what are you investing in, and why do you believe there is a market opportunity to invest in, explain to us. Second point is we would do some due diligence concerning the investment process. So what is the process of how uh, you discover inefficiencies in the market, how you exploit these inefficiencies? Uh, are you focusing on a few opportunities only? And are, are you the only manager to do so? Or are there a hundred others doing the same thing? Is there a special recipe you have in place? Uh, what's the sort of best practice you use in your investment process? Do you have any particular competitive advantage in doing so? So it's scrutinizing the investment process. Third step is uh, looking into the organization. How stable is it? Um, do they have uh, these particular teams in place for good research, trading, risk management? Uh, are the operations properly staffed? What about the compensation? Is it fair? What about the staff turnover? What about succession plans uh, for key people? So that would uh, give us a picture about the organization. People, that's more looking into the managers. Can we trust them? What's their experience? 
What about the integrity as an example? Then more business related, looking at the terms, terms and structure. Uh, our interest is invested in line with uh, the ones of the manager, uh, the fund manager, uh, how much money should be should we invest in that space? Uh, we would look into the service providers of the company. What about their lawyers, auditors, prime brokers, lenders, and so on? Are they all? Do they all have a good reputation? Uh, we would finally uh, check out the documents. Uh, for instance, what, what do we? What do we? Uh, what are we interested in investing in? Let's see the prospectus. Let's see the private placement memorandum. Uh, let's look through the audits of the company. So this would all be part of the due diligence, and finally we will have to write this up and uh, produce a, a more formal recommendation of whether we go ahead with the manager, yes or no, and for which reasons. Here a little example in terms of due diligence. So a manager for an endowment is assessing a number of hedge fund managers, so they want to select one. The manager doesn't spend any time on investigating the type of risk management those hedge fund managers employ. So the question mark is then, he would under investigate which area of the due diligence process. And the answer is B. He would under investigate in the area of organization because risk management is part of the organization. A step which we should undertake here as part of the due diligence effort. Then a few uh, uh, bits and pieces of information concerning uh, what uh, advisors of private wealth clients should consider when they sit together with a private wealth client, as is indicated in this picture, <coughs> and advise the client on particular alternative investments. So then we would say, dear client, you have to be aware of tax issues. Uh, because alternative investments, sometimes they involve partnerships, sometimes they involve more complex structures, and they have very distinct, maybe unknown to us, tax issues. So that's something we need to get to the bottom of. Second, we would say to the client, in terms of suitability, so not all of these uh, alternative investments might be suitable for you, we have to think about time horizons and liquidity needs. Some of these alternative investments might be illiquid, then we need to think about the client's liquidity needs, that does this fit together, uh, etc. The communication with the client is generally a little bit tricky because alternative investments tend to be complex, and if we have to deal with a non-professional investor, that just compounds the problem a little bit. So we have a little bit of a bigger challenge in letting that conversation uh, happen. And then one very specific thing is here, the so-called decision risk. So it's the risk of the client changing their strategy right at the point of when these you know, are at the maximum loss. So this will be damaging to the client. Uh, and the decision risk is increased for strategies which show frequent small positive returns and relatively infrequent large negative return. So when we have sort of a negative skewness in the return distribution, quite often things are going very well, but then relatively infrequently quite some uh, hefty uh, negative returns. Uh, another situation is where we have ext generally extreme returns relative to the mean, both to the left side and to the right side. So with an unusual degree of frequency, which means high kurtosis, uh, that might also lead clients then to jump ship um, so that's a, that's, that's a risk, a risk, a decision risk we have to be aware of when we make a re recommendation as an advisor to a private wealth client. And then the last point is, has to do with concentrated equity positions of the private client present in a closely held company. If that is the case, we would have to check whether any kind of recommendation concerning an alternative uh, um, asset, alternative investments um, uh, affect the private client's risk and liquidity. So for instance, if the uh, client has a concentrated stock position uh, or they have a um, yeah, concentrated stock position in a closely held company, for instance, or they are business owner uh, and they cannot sell the, the share they have that company, 
that easily if we recommend an alternative asset which is also pretty illiquid, we will just increase the total illiquidity of their position. So we have to take the personal situation of the private wealth client into account. And that ends our subsection one here. Alternative investment, alternative investments portfolio management. One of the asset classes we are looking at here is real estate. So we have abbreviated this with RRE for real estate. And uh, here importantly, we have a distinction between direct investments and indirect investments. So direct investment, direct real estate. Okay, these are buildings, residences, um, business real estate, offices, agricultural land. So everything which is indicated here, direct investment. So bricks and mortar, so to say. Indirect investment has more to do with investing in companies who do something with real estate. So for instance, uh, we can uh, invest in firms that are engaged in real estate ownership. So they own, for instance, office malls, uh, real estate development, real estate management. So home builders, real estate operating companies, and so on. We can invest in those companies. Indirect investment will also be investing through the means of real estate investment trusts. The rates. So rates are publicly traded equities representing pools of money which is simply invested in real estate properties or also real estate uh, debt. Then we have a third um, type of indirect investment, which is called commingled real estate funds. These are simply professionally managed vehicles for substantial pooled investments in, uh, once again, real estate properties. We might have also several managed accounts. <clears throat> they are often offered by the commingled real estate funds. Uh, this might be good for clients that uh, who have a very unique goal, which is obviously not met by the other funds. And then finally, we have infrastructure funds. So for these, they, they would allow private investments in uh, public infrastructure, for instance, in uh, roads. Uh, and uh, these infrastructure funds that would have uh, would, would get rights to specify the revenue streams for instance, over a contracted period, over 20 years, over 30 years, uh, if it has, for instance, to do with the motorway. Just an example. Uh, the, in the red box, we have some further variations, flavors. For instance, uh, real estate investment trusts focus on equity. Uh, those who are also uh, investing in mortgages, hybrid rates. Uh, we talked about the commingled real estate. Uh, uh, real estate funds and also about the infrastructure investments. So that uh, difference is important because we also have very specific benchmarks for them. So if you look into the two key benchmarks which are relevant in the United States, so the first one is called the NC Life Property Index. Now, this is the index from the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries. Now, this index measures direct real estate investment. That's important. Uh, and it measures it on a quarterly basis. So it's essentially sampling the price changes of a set of commercial properties, which are owned by large uh, American institutions. Uh, so the price data, the price information needs to come from somewhere, and it comes from private real estate funds. Uh, it's based on their appraisals. Uh, so that's important. It's, these are, it's also evaluated then, and it flows uh, into that index. Uh, the NC Life Property Index, it includes sub-indices, which are grouped by whatever real estate sectors and also regions in the United States. Uh, most important here is that the value is determined by property appraisals. And typically appraisals are done for instance, once a year, so not every week. This implies there is some degree of inertia uh, uh, included. And because of the appraisals, as mentioned here, uh, volatility is typically underestimated. So volatility of the returns is typically underestimated because we do these appraisals. So we don't have a, a, a daily snapshot of actual uh, values. 
So because, because of that, because the volatility is underestimated, methods have been put in place to unsmooth the return, such return series, uh, to achieve a more realistic picture. And uh, there's a variation of this property index in place, which is called the unsmoothed uh, in CRIF index. So that's important to remember. So we have the index here first, and then its variation down here. Um, also important is that this is not an investable uh, index. 